I'd like to take a few moments to remember a man who was my counselor, my co-worker, and my friend. Brooks Benjamin came to Mowgli long before I did. If, after five seasons, he graduated with a 1956 Den. People like Arthur Bradbury and William B. Hart Jr. remember him as a stalwart Denite and a really good friend. After a couple of years on the junior staff, he returned to Mowgli in 1962. This was a really pivotal year for Mowgli. Our very existence was in doubt. Mr. John Adams, who was the director, owned the camp, and he realized that he was not making enough money to pay the mortgage. The bank was threatening to foreclose. Three, three or four men who went to camp in the 30s and, and 20s were trying to raise the money to buy the camp and create an independent foundation to run it. And because we're here now, we know they were successful, but it was definitely not a sure thing. Then Mr. Adams had a terrible skiing accident that winter. He was laid up for weeks. He wasn't able to go out and meet new campers the way he usually did. So the camp was really small. Only 45 boys, less than half the number of people that, that, you, that you have here. And there were no cubs. And, and uh, there were only six people in Panther. It was, a very th it, was a, it was a very thin year. But of course, you know, I didn't know about any of this because 62 was my den year. And that was the best year I had here. It was the year of the Pemi Peaks trip, the Mount Washington squad, making the inner circle, and the blue racing crew. Mr. Benjamin was hired originally to be the junior Baloo counselor. There were a few boys in, in Baloo, which was the youngest dorm at that time. And, and uh, they were, he, he was there to give them a little extra help because they normally would have been cubs. But uh, he also was designated Blue Crew leader. And that's how I got to know him. Now, I don't have to tell any of you guys how intense that race is or how badly you want to win, want to win. I wanted to win more than anything I'd ever experienced. And it was a really close race. The Reds got out ahead of us by a foot or, a foot or two of it after the sprint. We made it up with power drives in the middle, but then at the end the sprint started and it was very close, but in the end they beat us by two feet. I was crushed. We were all really disappointed. We sat for a long time in the Blue Crew boathouse, talking quietly to Mr. Benjamin, trying to get ourselves together, while outside we could hear the Reds celebrating, you know, throwing the coxswain into the lake and jumping, and jumping in after him. I was really sad that evening, and the next day too. But looking back on it, <coughs> I realized that Mr. Benjamin was keeping an eye on me, because he would come up behind me, like when I was standing on the athletic field or walking down to the waterfront, touch me on the shoulder and say, hey Chaz, how you doing? And we talk a little bit, nothing very serious or heavy, but I always felt better afterwards and it helped me get past that loss and that disappointment and move on to have a great final week of camp. Now, for the next four years, he was the Cub Director and I was on the junior staff. The first year he was cub director with Jerry Hakes, but later he was cub director with his wife, Joan, who he had met at Principia College. And they were a wonderful couple, and I loved to drop by, usually after dinner, and we would, uh, we would sit on the cub writing porch and talk. But I noticed that even though we were just having a friendly conversation, he never stopped watching. He was always making sure that everybody was okay. Now, Frank Hubbard, who later became our water master, <coughs> he uh, <coughs> really was impressed at how Brooks kept track of all 16 boys. And he, but he also remembers a time when uh, they were on Baloo, uh, on, uh, out, on the, out on the lake in Belle Isle, and they got hit by a ferocious storm. It knocked down the wall tent, scattered everybody's belongings. They were just starting to they were just starting to uh, make dinner. It uh, doused the fire, scattered the food all over the place. The storm passed quickly and Brooks knew what he had to do. 
it's about 200 yards to, from Belle Isle to the shore. He swam over to the shore, got to a phone, called the camp, borrowed a rowboat from someplace, and by the time the camp van was there, all the boys and staff were ferried over, ready to go, ready to go back. Got him back in time for a late dinner. That was, that was the sort of man he was. Uh, Dwight Shepard, who was not a cub, he was in Baloo, but Brooks was the leader of a, of a group of Christian science boys that met once a, we once a week. And <coughs> Dwight says that that first season, he was scared and homesick, and Brooks noticed, and they talked. And it, he had helped him get through that period, and Dwight, of course, became a very successful Mowgli guy, graduating with the 1967 Den. His last season was 1971, and he and I worked together on a number of things. But I don't think that, that when we said goodbye, we realized what a watershed time it was, because after, after he left that summer, he never returned. He did four years in the Air Force as a briefing officer in, in, in Korea and Vietnam. Then he returned to Principia College, where he worked in admissions and financial aid, and his wife worked in alumni relations. They were there 30 years. He died, he died early this year. He was 81. Mowgli friendships are really special because they survive separations of distance and time. Brooks and I kept in touch for all those many years afterwards. And he was someone who I thought of often when I, when I was, when I was on, on campus here. His kind, thoughtful way with people made a huge impression on me. And although he isn't with us anymore, he is in the hearts of me and all his friends. Thank you.